if cash goes into the restaurant from sales for a day, what happens to it? You know, where does it go next? And how does that get accounted for in your business? From Swoop, it's Take the Plunge, a podcast about how business owners decided to stop what they were doing and took the plunge to start their own business. We take a look at how they came to that decision and what those first crucial steps were in getting their business up and running. My name is Kieran Burke, and I'll be your host for this episode. This morning, we're joined by Fing Leeson, one half of the team that founded Bunsen. Bunsen pioneered what we deem a quality burger in Ireland. Their straight up burgers have set the standard of what a burger experience should be. Since launching their first store in Dublin in Wexford Street in 2013, Finn and Tom have gone on to open eight restaurants across the country. We're very lucky to be joined by Finn this morning. Uh, thank you very much for coming on and joining us. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks for having me. No problem. Um, so let's, I suppose, take it back to eight years ago, 2012, 2013. Yeah. And you were working away, kind of what made you decide that a kind of working career wasn't for you and you decided to maybe uh, give it a go at setting up a, a business? Well, I think it was kind of something I always, I always wanted to do. But the job I was in at the time was kind of, you know, consultancy work that was you know projects that had a long timeline and i found just the pace wasn't really suited to you know getting the most out of me so i kind of felt like i was i could maybe be a bit more engaged in what i was doing and that was kind of the genesis to get me Mm -hmm. out of the job and at the time i was trying to you know keep my options open think about a few different things i was just sure for the time being i was leaving the professional world and then I had a cousin of mine, Tom, who I started Bunsen with. We had been spending our time bizarrely writing a script for a TV show that we wanted to make. And, you know, we submitted it to the BBC. It was, it was really bad um, and it got rejected. <laughs> but, it, but it got us kind of, we were kind of getting used to working with each other. Exactly. And then, you know, Tom had been training as a chef at the same time. And I've been kind of trying to get this burger business off the ground. And so there wasn't a great big plan. It more just kind of, I had quit my job and then I just fell into Bunsen. It was meant to be just a temporary thing. What was originally meant to be a week came four weeks, then three months. And then, you know, seven and a half years later, still here. <laughs> yeah. Those, those first couple of steps, what do you have to focus on first? Like, was it hard to get a premise? Yeah. Like, how did you come up with the name? Um, how, was, how was that whole experience? Yeah. So the hardest thing when you're starting a new restaurant is definitely getting the premises. And people probably don't mm-hmm. realize that's the hard bit because landlords, they don't really want to be the people who take the risk on the first uh, operation of a certain business. So that's really hard. So that's, that took a long time. I would say Tom was probably looking for maybe a year and a half before we signed the lease in Wexford Street. And alongside that, a lot of product testing and the name is Bunsen, Bunsen Burger. It's kind of like a, kind of like a pun, but it had a a nod to, uh, Tom had worked for Heston Blumenthal. There was kind of a scientific approach to cooking and that was mm-hmm. kind of part of the name and i had some really bad suggestions for a name at the time which i won't mention what they are but you know i think the name is less important than for us we had a clear idea of what the business was going to mm-hmm. offer and then it's just about trying to get the right location yeah and for anyone who hasn't been to bunsen uh, the, the yeah. menu is on a business card it's all about right. simplicity you've got you've got a pretty pretty limited choice in mm-hmm. terms of what, what you can have yeah was that was the intention from from the get-go and, and kind of how did you get to that decision so yeah the uh the menu is on a business card you can order a burger with cheese or without and you can double it up as well and the idea came from we had lived in new york Loved a lot of the burger places there. The best ones we thought were the ones without any fuss. They were very simple. And a lot of what we felt were the kind of the better places in New York, uh, they were all either mincing their own beef fresh or getting a custom blend made by well-known trade butchers in New York. No one was doing Mm -hmm. that in the Irish market. So we kind of thought, let's, you know, everybody in Ireland loves to champion Irish beef. We thought, let's make a business where 
the center of it is the beef in a burger. If we kept it simple, then that's how you're differentiating yourself. Yep. At the time, the places that were popular were a bit more multi-topping and a lot of different options. And we felt like if we cut it back to you know its classic form, and if we could execute that, then that's something we would like to buy. So that was the mm-hmm. idea. Yeah, and I'm very much nice. borrowing from a couple of places that we absolutely loved in Manhattan. I suppose crucially, when you're in the service industry, people play a huge role. Sure. Uh, so how has hiring played a big role? Uh, for you in terms of being able to recruit people, maintain people? Has it been an easy process? What have you kind of learned from doing it? Yeah, I mean, honestly, we were very lucky in that we now have a team of seven people in our head office. And I think all of them have worked for us, worked for Bunsen for five years or more. A lot of them, a couple of them even were there from day one. To be honest, Mm -hmm. a few people we just got really lucky with. They're really highly skilled people with a lot of experience and they kind of guided the business as it went on. Mm -hmm. That made the recruitment of senior staff as we went on a little easier because nearly everybody has gone through the process of working in one of the restaurants and has come up through the business that way. There is no one in a senior position who hasn't actually come up through the business that way. So in one sense, that makes it easier to screen who's going to develop well, you know, and who's going to be able to add value to the business. We've definitely had a lot of hiring decisions that haven't gone right as well. I mean, it's, it's intensive business in terms of how many people are working there. And it's also an Mm -hmm. industry that there's a natural turnover in. I think at first I remember panicking when, you know, our first really experienced person left And I remember the first time someone working in the kitchen said they were leaving. This is probably three, four months into business. And it was just so gutting. And then after a while, you realize that you have to back yourselves to be able to figure out if someone who you felt was crucial moves on. That's part of any business, I think. And how did yourself and Tom go by kind of divvying up some of those roles at the start? Was it just that you felt you were natural fits for for certain parts of the business to take ownership on? How, How did that happen? Was there a decision between you guys or did you just decided to take certain parts yeah i guess some of it was just kind of organic that there were some skills that were you know that i had that tom didn't and vice versa and then there's some things that we probably do together in general we initially split the business up by front and back line so in every restaurant there's a front of house and a back of house i i took the front of house yeah he took the back of house i have a background more in finance so That was the kind of side of the business that I took over initially. And then there's some things that we would work on together. But Tom would have always taken care of the food and the property side and more of the marketing Mm -hmm. ends of the business. So I think we ended up gravitating to the things that we felt like we were good at. But, you know, sometimes you got to do tasks that you're not great at. But part of the fun, I think, of starting a business is how much you don't know and how much you learn. You know, genuinely, I think back to our first year in business, I don't think I've ever learned as much in my life in that year, you know, and having gone to school and university and all that jazz, it's just not the same. Were there any kind of couple of things that kind of stuck out on from like when running it in the first year was any kind of big logistic moments where you're like, how the hell am I going to overcome this? Yeah, nothing, nothing comes to mind as like a big logistical headache. Everything was new, and I think probably ignorance is bliss a little bit at the start. You know, if you know too much, Mm -hmm. you might never actually do it. We felt like, well, we don't know anything about this business, but common sense should help us in a lot of cases. I think the things that we didn't appreciate, some of the finer details of how the retail trade works, and maybe there were a few things early on where we had advisors giving us advice on various elements that turned out to be bad advice and in hindsight, I think maybe a bit more, if we informed ourselves a bit more about a few things, and, and like we're, I'm talking about basic things, like if cash goes into the restaurant from sales for a day, what happens to it? You know, where does it go next? And how does that get accounted for in your business? Simple things like that. Probably didn't have a good grasp at the time. You know, some of them learned the hard way. As you were finding your fees, you were probably experienced quite a bit of hyper growth in terms of even in that first store, you were starting to get more and more customers, Mm. more and more staff coming on. When were you guys starting to feel comfortable about, okay, we're getting more of a handle of this operationally, we'd like to do more of this on a a bigger scale? When When did those kind of seeds start? 
Garda kind of selling? I like I think early on. Well, I mean, the, the we opened in June of 2013, and it was a baking hot summer, and it was actually really quiet. We had mm-hmm. almost no customers. The few customers that we did have felt like a lot at the time, you know, because you don't know what you're doing. We kind of, after maybe a month or two, could kind of see, okay, maybe there is potential opportunity for more Bunsen's or a bigger business. I mean, I would say we had a full restaurant maybe six months into the business. That's when you really feel like, okay, there's something here. And, you know, we felt like we were getting better. And I would say that six, seven months into trading, we were already thinking about another premise. Touching on those first couple of weeks, was it like, fuck, this is so nerve wracking, just like watching the door, seeing how many people are coming through, yeah. or were you, you, you calm? No, no, you're not calm at all. <laughs> it's like, it, it's incredible, the ups and downs. Like, it's very exhilarating. And you start off and you serve 10, 20 customers, and that feels incredible. But you live every moment like nothing. It's kind of, it's really hard to describe, but it's quite emotional. Uh, yeah, I and, can and you're open. Yeah, I mean, you you know, when you're open every day, your mind's just racing. Your your brain's just going all the time. You're kind of going on adrenaline. And then yeah. you're gutted some days when, you know, it could be that nobody came into the restaurant because it was really hot. And I remember yeah. we, you know, all these restaurant boxes are very popular now in COVID, but we, we tried this in 2013 because it was so yeah. hot and we thought oh maybe we can sell some barbecue at home burgers or whatever didn't really work yeah then. but um i remember we were we were kind of kind of desperate when you're watching the door or watching the clock and um, but then you know something bad could happen an upset customer a burger that didn't go out right uh, a bad review online like you really take uh, it all massively to heart at, at the start yeah. you you have to develop the, the thick skin. How do you do that? Because I even I, I, I even see things with like trust pilots. When you get a bad review, yeah. it just it, it it kind of wins you a bit. So how how do you, especially Tell in something like a service industry, you're you're so liable to anything on TripAdvisor. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, how, how do how do you manage that? No, it is. It's really disappointing. You just kind of have to just ignore it. Really, like we we always try and say one review is meaningless. But if there's a yeah. pattern, we'll listen to it, good or bad. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So yeah. now that doesn't that doesn't mean that some nights you'll read something and you won't be able to sleep thinking about it. But yeah. I think after a while you learn that it's just not productive to overthink these things. Because for us, you know, we're open every day and we've got to get up and do that every day with every customer that we have that day. You can't really look back too much. You gotta just get up, focus on the next day. And so after a while, the reviews just wash over you, you know, and you, yeah. you you forget the individual ones. But at the start, they really, they really sting. Hey, like, again, service industry, maybe not a background of being in it before, but like things like things working all the time. Is the electricity yeah. going to go off? Are the toilets going to break? Is there sure. going to be issues in the kitchen? Hey, hey, did you, it was just like, okay, just stay calm on the outside, panic on the inside and just get get through it. Pretty much, like, I think one of the most stressful things you can experience in a restaurant is when the restaurant is full and the fire alarm is going off (laughs) and you don't have the key to turn it off. (laughs) And all the customers are looking at you and it's just, you can barely think it's so loud. (laughs) And that is just a nightmare. And you just have to go through that a few times. And then you just learn, you always know where the bloody key for the fire alarm is. (laughs) So that, you know, if it happens again, uh, but you do you you appreciate people who fix toilets and people yeah. who fix fridges and all these things you absolutely need to to trade. Yeah. It's you, a constant worry, you know. Do you, do you feel you are just now you've got like a great roller deck, so to speak, of all um, these yeah these like people that you can yeah you build up a network of people that are reliable. You know, it's a big part of any any business that has property. And equipment yeah. that's being used like this, it's it's a big part of it. I remember very well our first year early in, we had a major plumbing issue. And a guy yeah. came out kind of 2 a.m. on a Saturday night and, you know, waded through. And he opened the drains. <laughs> he got down there. And I was shocked. I'd never seen him. Never seen anything <laughs> like it in my life. Fair this play. guy was, you know, working late into the night. Not, you know, no one was giving him any thanks, and he was doing 
what a man. He's doing a tough job, yeah. What a man. Yeah. I think about him a lot. He's uh, just going about his business, sorting yeah. people's problems. <laughs> Getting no credit. <laughs> <laughs> Was he has he been has he been back a couple of times since to sort out the plumbing or uh, no no not not that issue particularly yeah. but uh yeah I mean there's always there's always potential for issues uh, for sure. Uh, just going back to kind of the growth element, okay, yeah. six seven six, seven months in you're like, okay, actually, I think we're getting a bit of a handle on this. Mm-hmm. How, how, how do you feel now? Uh, you mentioned the start, it was very tough getting a property as a first time. Was it easier now to, to start to see opportunities come come to you? How did you go about kind of deciding where, where the next opportunity should, should be or where you guys should yeah. go? Yeah, so we're, we're in Dublin, which is both of our, you know, we've both grown up, myself and my business partner in Dublin. We know it pretty well. So we kind of started to identify where were the streets we'd like to be and mm-hmm. uh, where do we think could work? You know, we were trying to find, you're trying to find restaurants that aren't doing great because the places that are doing well, they're not, they're not going to be interested in leaving their location. Uh, so we were trawling like the bottom of TripAdvisor in areas that we were looking for. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the problem can be actually getting on the phone with the actual person who owns the business. Mm-hmm. So what our second location uh, is in Temple Bar, which is kind of like a touristy part of Dublin. And a couple have been running it for 30 years. We, you know, we'd slipped a letter through the door. Nobody got back to us. We ended up kind of, you know, a bit of a trick to get onto them, whereby we mailed them saying that we wanted to pay them to use their brand in, a, in another location or another territory. And could they call us about this? And that's how we got them on the phone. And then ultimately nice. we made a deal with them to take over their business. And I think at that point we risked every money, every bit of money that we'd made yep. in the initial unit. So we were doubling up really. And that was very nerve wracking because. <laughs> how long know, did it take you to, to get to the decision? Like fuck it, we're, um, we're, we're, we're going all in, so to speak. Did it take, was it a quick decision? Uh, the, hard, the longer thing was actually negotiating the terms of a deal for the people who yeah. were leaving the restaurant. So so I think we we had made the decision and the property was being was was held up in Nama which is kind of uh, was kind of linked to the government. So it was all very slow and it took a long yeah. time to actually negotiate. But I remember you know when the the moment that you kind of realize you, know, you have that feeling where you, you kind of think, oh, shit, this is it now, is when you've actually signed the lease. Because then you've, yeah. you know, there's no going back. You're not taking in any money, but you're already, you've already committed a huge amount of expenditure. And that's nerve wracking. Mm-hmm. And then you don't feel better about it ever. I mean, you never feel better about it. It always just feels like uh, there's something going to be wrong. And you never have that moment of, oh, it's, it's, it, it's working now. Because yeah. there's always something that isn't working. So you're always thinking about what's the potential reasons it could go wrong or how could it be better or, you know. Did the, did the decision-making process get any easier as you're going three, four, five, six, seven, eight? Um, or you're like, oh, every, every time yeah. you're about to, to, to sign that dotted line. No, it does get a bit easier, but you always have a, you always have that feeling to a degree. But I think the less of, you know, when you're going from one to two units, it's your whole business you're doubling up. And then, you know, you're going to a third, it, it reduces, you know, so the risk to the company of something going bad gets lower at every additional unit. So that does make yeah. it a bit easier. And you start to feel a bit more comfortable in your decisions. You're always just worried. I mean, I think that's, <laughs> I think that's just the permanent state of mind for a lot of people running yeah. businesses like, like ours. Um, I think any business is just that's, absolutely, absolutely. That's what business is it's just worrying and all the time. This, despite the worries, you've done an incredible job to to get from one restaurant to eight restaurants and and create such a popular brand, well known brand that people become so synonymous with with burgers and with with it within Ireland. Um, so, what do you feel? Are there a couple of steps there that you look back on and think, yeah, we did we did a pretty awesome job there, or that that was that was a good bit of luck, or is, is there any kind of marquee moments for you that really stood out? Yeah, like I think having a menu that's on a business card was a really really smart thing to do. I think I think that stood to us very well, and I think the philosophy of keeping it simple it's probably paid dividends 
more than we could have realized at the start. It, it makes your operation a lot more efficient, I think, financially. Yep. But also for the customer, they know exactly what they're going to get when they come to Bunsen. And so I think that allowed us to build a very strong brand image because it was very clear what you were getting when you came to Bunsen. There wasn't much confusion about the brand. And our job then is just to be consistent and to execute it consistently every day, as much mm -hmm. as possible with every customer. But mm -hmm. I think the simplicity of the idea really helped us to cement in people's minds what we were and why it was worth coming back to us. A lot of why people decide to eat certain things is, is word of mouth. And it's just a very yeah. easy message to say, did you hear about this place? It's got a menu with a business card and it's cheese, no cheese. It's, a, it's an easy tagline. And yeah. that allowed us to concentrate on the actual operations of just hitting hitting what we were promising, you know? That's definitely true. I mean, anyone who's tasted a Buns and Burger will attest to just how, how good it is. So they're, they're no doubt gonna, gonna tell the next person on the street. But you still have that issue, particularly when you open a restaurant one in Dublin or in Cork or in Belfast. How do you get those first customers to the door? What, what kind of tactics were you using there in terms of getting the, the, those customers through so they mm -hmm. can test the product and obviously be be champions for Bunsen thereafter? It's sometimes it's easier than other times. When we opened our second location in Temple Bar, which I was talking about earlier, we put up a sign outside the restaurant. I actually can't remember exactly what it said, but I think it was something like tasty restaurant opening soon or something. And there was a couple of misspellings and the font was really basic. And the idea was to, you know, to get to troll the, the food bloggers, the people that are interested in this stuff, and for the reveal to ultimately be that it was us. And that worked quite well to get a bit of attention. We did a similar thing. We got a premises in a kind of a trendy Dublin suburb called Ranla, that me and you know very well. Lovely right? spot. Yeah. I do. And it was around the time that Trump was just coming into the headlines. So we, we put up a sign there that said, make Ranla great again. And again, we misspelled it. And, that, you know, all of those things helped to kind of generate a bit of buzz. But another thing that we did, and this kind of serves both to get people in the door, but also as a way for us to test the capacity and come back to, we were talking earlier about equipment working. Every time we open a restaurant, we do a couple of hours of completely free burgers. People queue up. We see, we really try and make as many burgers as we can for three or four hours. And it always gets a bit of a queue. And again, yep. a couple of photos on social media. It gets people to know that, oh, Bunsen have a new location here. But yep. with Cork and with Belfast, it wasn't as easy. You know, you're, yep. you're kind of starting from scratch again. There's some people that might know you, but you kind of have to build your customer base. And for us, always the only real effective way of marketing that we have found is uh, you know, executing our product as well as we can for the customers that we do have. And that will spread out. That's the best marketing mm -hmm. you can do. We still haven't found a great way other than that as to how to yeah. break into a new market, you know? Yeah, I think there are some pretty pretty amazing tactics as well and definitely good inspiration for anyone listening. Um, the other thing that I was really interested to chat to you about is you launched Bunsen before the kind of delivery Uber Eats uh, element kind of started to kick in and, and pretty sure. much revolutionize a lot of the restaurant industry. What was your thought process as delivery and Uber Eats started to come more and more on the scene and, and how have how do you think about it as, as a service and as an industry? Yeah, it's a complicated question, but I think initially we were very skeptical about delivery or just eat or delivery um, for a business like ours. It's not traditionally the, the food that delivers the best. And we were always worried that, you know, would um, offering delivery damage your brand and would it lower the opinion of your customers or the opinion of, of your brand and customers' mind a bit? You know, this is always a concern. But there's no doubt that personally, you know, as a customer of any food business, I like the convenience of being able to get food to my door. Yeah. So we were always conscious that it was probably going to be something that it's a trend that wasn't going to be going anywhere. 
at some point we're yeah. going to have to engage them in some way. Yeah. And so back, back to your question earlier about how did we get to a place in Cork where people knew who we were and tried us. And a part of that actually, part of making a successful business there was uh, working with the delivery partner and mm -hmm. using that to get into more people. And yeah, that then helped our in restaurant sales, which is maybe a surprise at the start. We, we weren't expecting that, but yeah. it actually helped us to broaden the number of customers we had in that city. I think that there's a huge potential for it, for the, you know, if anyone's in the food business or going to be thinking about the food business, delivery is uh, going to have to be a part of those plans. You want to try as much as possible to give as good an experience as you get in a restaurant. It's never going to be the same though. I think most customers realize that. It's one of the things I would say we've changed our mind most about. You know, we were very resistant at first and over time, we've definitely been won over to, you know, what it can do, especially as a kind of an ancillary bit of business. If it's your primary business, I'm not sure how, you know, it's slightly different. So for us, it's, it's yeah. an add on that works quite well. And I, I don't think it's going to slow down anytime soon. Really. You've been really transparent and open just in terms of the trepidations that people business owners have in terms of running yeah. their business and, and the, the constant state of unease you might be in and, <laughs> and the various different pressures that, that, yeah. that exist. I'm not really selling it, am I? Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're seven and a half years in, you've got yeah. outdoors, you, you have been very successful. What what are you and Tom thinking at the moment in terms of are you very happy the way you have it at the moment yeah. or is there still that hunger and desire to do more, create more with, with you guys? Yeah, sorry, I should I should have said that it is great fun. Um like it's <laughs> I I don't ever regret leaving my you know my professional life behind. I feel very fortunate to be in the position that we're in. Yeah. The business is very uh, is doing great and has been doing great and you know running a business with a partner that you have a very good relationship with is a very fulfilling thing to do and mm -hmm. you know i feel like it brought me out of my comfort zone so much it's changed me a lot and it's definitely something i would recommend if anyone's thinking about <laughs> i i feel like it's a great way to maximize your own effort you know you're never gonna yeah. engage with something more uh, than if it's your own thing i still get massive enjoyment from it and you know, our outlook really hasn't changed over the seven years. We do it because we enjoy it and we're going to keep growing the business. We have a Mexican restaurant as well, which is a partner with um, my brother. And we're always looking at new other type of hospitality businesses as well as, um, you know, we're hoping to grow Bunsen. That's our plan. Obviously, this year has been very strange in this industry, probably in most industries. But again, it's felt a bit like back to year one where you've had to learn a lot on the go, a lot of new things, and that can be very exhilarating. And there were definitely yeah. some tough days this year, but you realize, you know, you're going to crash course in crisis management, which I think is Absolutely. a good thing. Yeah, like we're excited about the future. Yeah. Amazing. Finn, I can't thank you enough for coming on and joining us today. Uh, it's been awesome to hear uh, a little insight and a snapshot into the Bunsen journey. And you've been incredibly honest with us and forthright about the different steps. I uh, can't thank you enough. So thanks, Emil, for, for joining us and uh, hope you have a lovely day today too. My pleasure, yeah. Same to you, thanks for having me.